Uh, my name is Benel. I am the worship pastor on staff at church here. Um, it has been a crazy journey to get here. I remember when Sam had asked me to, we were at our leadership meeting, and I thought he was joking initially. Um, I was like, you really want me to speak on Sunday morning? Um, I, am, I remember I always tell friends of mine, I was like, I never would understand why people invite me to speak. My degree was in music. Um, I was like, speaking definitely wasn't my, <clears throat> my forte whatsoever. Uh, but this morning, I'm really excited. I get to share part of my journey and my story with you guys. And um, we're going to talk about a concept that's really been in my heart for a little bit. Actually, since the past, this past two years have been a really radical just roller coaster of um, experience. And uh, this morning, we're just going to go through some scripture. And we're going to talk about a few truths that really changes how I see the gospel and how I see the kingdom. So that's cool with you guys. Um, in the 1800s, there was a chemist. Uh, he was, his name was Alfred Noble, and he developed what they called dynamite. And most of us are familiar with what dynamite is. And he made his living off of dynamite. He made most of his money. He had, I think at one point, they said 200 patents in his name at one point. He was very, very wealthy. Um, and then, so he was very well off, and dynamite was used for various things. And um, it was, he was doing really, really well. And then a freak accident happened. Okay? In 1888, he wakes up one morning and reads the newspaper. Uh, and he sees his name in the obituary. And he's like, what in the world? He's like, this is weird. Um, and this is what I read. I'm going to read it to you guys. <clears throat> okay, so after all, he woke up, and it described him as a man who had made it possible to kill, kill more people quickly than anyone else else would ever live. Um, and that's, and what's, what's so interesting, he, it was his brother who had passed away, but the newspaper had misheard what had happened, and they thought Alfred Noble had now passed away. So now he's reading his obituary for the first time in life. He goes, so I've died, and I'm remembered by the man who's allowed people to kill the most people. And something revolutionary changed in his heart. Something really, really changed in his spirit. He said, I don't want to be remembered by this. I don't want to be identified by these things because that's not what I thought the world saw me as. So this is what he did. Um, and most of us don't know Alfred Noble for uh, developing dynamite, but we know him for the one who actually founded the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, that is what he's most known for, though he made the most money and everything his wealth was off the dynamite. But what he's now known and the, the legacy he holds is for creating the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, see, Alfred Noble understood something at one point in his life. He had a chance to see how the world saw him and how people saw him, and he saw what his, identi what his identity was known as to the world. And his, his realization came to the point saying, that's not who I want to be, and that's who I refuse to be. So he made a, a vast decision at that point and said, I will no longer live like this. See, I wonder what it would look like if, if all of us at one point in our life could wake up in the morning and read the obituary and said, Bill Chaka, I don't even want to know what people would say about me, <laughs> um, or whatever the world would say, or whatever people would say, whatever I would say about myself if I wrote my own obituary, who I saw myself as as a person. If I had a chance to look at myself and say, this is who I am, is that who I really wanted to be, or is that like, what I felt like I was intended to be? This morning, we're going to read a story from Scripture that um, when I was in school, I took a class. Um, uh, and I'm not going to bore you guys with too much of this stuff because it, it confused me in college, so I'm not trying to confuse you guys this morning. It was a class called Greek, um, Greek 101, and it was the worst class I've taken in my entire life. Um, it was a foreign language, literally. Um, I felt I was sitting in class and I'm saying, how or why am I trying to do this? Um, but long story short, one of the assignments was we were given a, a scripture, and the whole goal was to, we had to read it both in English and then in Greek, Okay. So we had to read it in both languages, and we had to say, what do you get the difference on these? I was like, oh. I was like, what's the point of this? So my professor looked at me and goes, well, you're going to read um, John 21. I was like, all right, John 21. I was like, what is that? So I opened it up, John 21, 15 to 19. He goes, read that and write me a 10-page paper on it. I was like, 10-page paper on like four verses. I was like, you're crazy. I was like, absolutely. Um, so then I sat, and I prepared it. We're going to read together, and then we're going to kind of go through um, what God really spoke to me in this chapter, and then we're going to share on a few things. So John 21, verse 15. It should be up here uh, if you guys don't have scriptures or you guys can follow along with me. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, Do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted to. And when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you to where you do not want to go. So that I had heard in church my whole life. And I, I had heard probably at that point about 40 sermons on this scripture. I had heard that um, the reason that Jesus and Peter has accomplished it three times was because Peter betrayed Jesus three times, and it was like a, a figurative image and all this stuff. Um, real quick backstory for those of you guys that don't know what's happening here. Um, Peter um, was one of the inner circle of Jesus, okay? Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends. Um, and at the Last Supper, Jesus said to Peter that you will betray me three times. And Peter said, I will never betray you, Jesus. Are you joking? How could I betray you? After everything I've seen, after everything I've done, how could I betray you? They're like best friends, honestly. They're like, seriously, like they... If Jesus went anywhere, if, even if the rest of the disciples weren't there, he was one of the few that Jesus took along with him. <clears throat> so Peter, um, before Jesus, was a fisherman, okay? So he, had a, he was known to have a sailor's mouth, and uh, he wasn't the most holy of men. Uh, but Jesus found him at a place where he was fishing, okay? Um, so then let's fast forward. Peter, Jesus gets crucified. Peter does deny him three times, um, and just as Jesus said, and Peter runs. And Peter runs back to what he first known to fishing, okay? So Peter's now back on the sea, and he's fishing again, and Jesus meets him at the sea once again. It's like a reflection. It's really, really, it's a beautiful picture um, that Jesus does. It's a reflection of what happened before. So now Jesus and Peter are meeting one more time, okay? And so now that we know what's happening here, um, let's talk about one more thing, and then we'll go into scriptures. In the Greek, um, so in English, we have the word love, right? We know, we know love. We my, our parents said it to us growing up, or we say it to significant others or something. The word love, it, we know, we have an understanding when we hear love, what it means. <clears throat> in Greek, it wasn't so simple. Um, if you study that language, so in Scripture, there's four words in Greek that actually translate it to the word love that we see today. Um, the two we're going to talk about today are agape and phileo. Okay, so I know they sound like, what are you talking? Agape is known in, in, in the Greek as the greatest love the deepest love, a love from our Savior to us. Agape is supposed to be like the truest form of love, okay? Um, we, have, we get that? So agape, truest form of love, it means like it's the deepest bond you can have with someone. Phileo is like a brotherly love, um, <clears throat> like of an acquaintance or a close friend. Um, it's, that's what phileo means, okay? Um, so if you read in Scripture, like an individual was phileo ph- uh, someone, it was like a brotherly love that you cared for the person, yeah. It, it wasn't just like a qu- you cared and you loved for the person, but it wasn't agape. And by no means, because agape was the deepest love. Cool? Um, so now we're going to reread this Scripture, and I'm going to switch out the word love for what the Greek says the conversation looked like. And, we're gonna, and then we're going to talk about a few things and how my life was radically changed by this scripture. So can we read it one more time? And I'm going to change out the word love for the Greek words. <clears throat> so here we go. Um, when, they f- when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son, Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said a second time, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He said to him, tend to my sheep. He said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you fillet me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you fillet me? He said, Lord, you know everything. So I read this in the Greek, and I was like, this has to be wrong. I was like, this has to be wrong. Like, this can't make sense to me. Um, this doesn't make sense because if I went to an individual and said, hey, do you love me? I said, yeah, I kind of like you. It's like, what? That's not what I expect to hear. Um, so imagine that. So Jesus and Peter are having this conversation, right? And he goes, Peter, do you love me? He goes, yeah, Lord, I like you. And he says it once, and twice, and then the third time he goes, do you even like me? 
He says, Lord, you know all things. See, this makes a lot more sense to me, though. Uh, because Peter and Jesus, like, like I said, weren't just acquaintances. And it wasn't just a casual friendship. Um, but Peter and Jesus were the closest of friends. So Peter can't lie to Jesus. Peter can't. Because Peter, if Peter's going to lie, like, do any of you guys have like, a best friend that you know when they're lying to you? Like I do. I have a best friend who <clears throat> tries to lie to me a lot. <clears throat> and, um, but every time they lie, I'm like, dude, like, why are you lying? Like, they're like, I don't know, man. Like, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, do you really think you're going to get away with this? He goes, bro, like, it just seemed the easy way to go out, you know? Uh, but Peter understood. Peter understood. Peter's like, no, I can't do this. I can't. I can't. Uh, so Peter was like, so he was honest with him. But this is what I want to touch on tonight. See, what Peter did in the moment of his sin, in the moment of his failure, when he betrayed Christ, as Christ had already told him, Peter's first response was to run. Peter's first instinct was to get far away and to get back what he knew. Um, if I had this conversation with someone and I said, hey, do you love me? And the response is, yes, I like you. I'd say, oh, okay, thank you. And I'd either stop texting them or I'd walk away, okay? Because I'd be very offended because I'd be like, oh, I definitely did not expect that. But here's what Jesus does. Jesus does something so profound that changed how I thought about myself as an individual and thought about life. Jesus heard the response of Peter and understood where Peter's response came from, but he still had asked Peter for a response to serve him. And I said, I remember asking my professor, what is happening here? He, he looked at me and goes, I gave you this portion for a reason, because I knew you'd have questions. Because I said, look, I don't get this, man. I don't understand what's happening. Why is Peter saying, I like you, and Jesus saying, still serve me? Why is he still asking for response of serving in the midst of a response that we didn't expect? And my professor said, go pray about it. Go think about it. <laughs> he goes, I'm not telling you nothing. He goes, I want you to see what the Lord speaks to you. So I've, I imagine this, I imagine life, imagine what we go through as a generation. I, I think about my own life. And I'm going to share a few stories from my story today with you guys and um, and how I feel similar to where Peter was also. Um, and how I often did what Peter did. That in the midst of my sin, in the midst of my failure, in the midst of my mistakes, um, my first response was to run. Um, my last response would think to serve, because my first response is, how could I serve after what I've just done? Is, I mean, are any of us there? Like, in, in, in the midst of a a fall in the midst of a sin, in the midst of a shortcoming, my, my last response is, oh, Lord, let me serve you. It's God, I'm not worthy. Like, are, do we agree on that? Um, so this morning, I, I want to challenge you guys with a statement that some of you guys are like, what? Um, so what would it look like if in the midst of our failure, in the midst of our sin, we stopped identifying ourselves by the sin in our fall, but we began to see ourselves the way Christ saw us? Okay, because when Christ saw Peter, it wasn't the betrayal Christ saw. Christ still saw his child. And see, and it was that what caused Christ to still require Peter to serve him. It's a strange call, and it's a hard call, and it changed how I saw the gospel because it made more sense to me. This morning we're going to talk about three misconceptions of our identity and then two, two truths that I want to leave with you guys. The first misconception is this. That we've been conditioned to believe that we must do enough good to outdo our bad. We as society, and this is me too, okay? Growing up, I had this understanding that um, I love the church I grew up in. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not bashing by any means. They were a great church, but I just didn't understand who Christ was to me when I was growing up. I really didn't. Uh, because Christ to me was a set of rules. And it was a, a way to... to um, my way to heaven was more of a formula and less of a relationship, if that makes sense. Um, and that's kind of how I saw who Jesus and this picture of God and everything. Um, so I remember thinking growing up, um, if I messed up or I sinned, the way for me to right my wrong was to do a good deed or to do something that um, even after, I'm, I'm going to be very honest with you, even after I entered ministry, um, in the midst of my sin or when I would fall, I feel like I would have to do a few better things to make myself feel better. Anyone disagree on this? 
Um, let me tell you guys, that is the worst thing you guys think, honestly. Number one misconception is that we have to do enough good to outdo our bad. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about why that's wrong after. I remember when I was young, um, I was, I'm one of four. Um, I'm the second. I'm the middle child. Um, I have middle child syndrome uh, in the sense of I, my parents, my mom always says, you moved out when you were 17. You were always the most independent. I was like, mom, I was a middle child. I was always neglected by you guys. Um, I'm joking. My, my parents loved me. My parents were the best, honestly. I loved them to death. Uh, but my parents always said, you really were the true middle child. Because I have an older brother. I have a little sister. Um, so she was always the baby. And then my, my older brother was the oldest. So I was just, I was there, you know? So I, I existed. And <laughs> uh, but I was always the independent one. So um, even when I would mess up at home or when I would um, do something wrong or when I didn't quite understand, because I, I did a lot of dumb things growing up. And um, I'm, I'll share a few with you guys as we go on today. Um, not all of it, uh, um, just because we're being recorded. And um, uh, so, um, but one of the things I remember doing um, was... I was, you could be like, well, I was 14, and I liked driving a lot. Um, I had this like desire to drive since I was like nine. Okay, like I'd always be like, Dad, let me drive. Like he's like, you're nine. <laughs> Where are you gonna drive to? I was like, please, please. Like I just really, really want to drive. Like I can do it. I know I can. He's like, no, 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 no. So and my dad's kind of scary. So when he says no, I'm not gonna say no to him. I was like, all right, fine. So like 10, 11, 12. I was like, Dad, I'm 12 now. Like, no, no, no. I was like, Dad, I'm a teenager. I'm driving, okay? He's like, what? I was like, yeah, but can mom teach me? Because I feel like you're going to scare me if you try to teach me how to drive. He's like, what? So my mom teaches me. Still a bad idea. I'm 13, okay? 13 years old. I get in the behind the wheel of a 1995 Nissan Maxima. And I remember this. I was like, my mom, my mom was like, all right, all right. You can drive now. I was like, all right, cool. Um, so I learned how to drive. It wasn't very good. I was 13. But I remember it was, I was, it was my 14th birthday. And I wanted to be really, really cool. Um, came home from school. My mom was sleeping. <laughs> so I, I wanted to drive, right? So I took the Maxima and I drove out. Uh, and I decided it would be a really cool thing to do if I took the car out and not get caught, right? So my mom wakes up and she's like, where's my son and where's my car? Right? And I'm like, oh, man. And then I didn't have a cell phone back then. I didn't have a cell phone until I was older. So I remember coming home and I was like, and I, I, did, I thought she'd still be sleeping. So I come home and I come to the house and my mom was like, all right, sit down. I'm like, all right. I'm like, what's up, mom? How was work? Blah, blah, blah. She's like, oh, no, you're good. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm in the clear. My dad comes home. And this is where, like, beauty happens here, right? Um, he's like, so mom told me you took the car out today. I was like, I took the car out. I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't take the car out. I was like, I went, came home. I did my homework. You know, what are you talking about? He goes, now you're lying. I was like, no, dad. And then and he goes, oh, I was like, so what I did was I actually had to go to church, you know? Um, I had to go to church and um, fix my drum set. <clears throat> so like, and I lived a street away from my church. I was like, Dad, it was like one turn. You go right. I needed to go tune my drum set. And and my dad's like, what? And my dad goes, did you think that by telling me you're going to church that it would make it okay? <laughs> and he's like, I was like, yeah, kind of. And he's like, what? I remember my dad looked at me. He goes, see, the problem is you thought that making it sound good would outweigh it, right? And he goes. He goes, but that's so absurd to me. He goes, because what you did was still wrong. He goes, but I'm still going to forgive you. And my dad, honestly, I thought he was going to, like, um, discipline me, <laughs> uh, to say, like, <laughs> the least. Uh, I really did. I honestly, I thought, I thought this was going to be it. I was like, man, my life is over. I'm never having friends. I'm never going out. I'm never doing anything because I'm 14, and I just took my dad's car out. My mom's car, sorry. Uh, but no, that wasn't how it was. Uh, I remember my dad looked at me. He goes, I know you really like driving because we've been talking since you're nine. But you need to understand something. Um, it's, it's, it's not about, don't feel like coming to me and justifying yourself. My dad always said this to me. Because when you mess up, just come and tell me. He's like, don't. He's like, don't come to me with this like, hey, I did this. And oh, here's this, by the way. He goes, don't. Because what that does to me is tell me that you can't come to me and just be honest and open with me. See, years later, that taught me a, a very truth about God also. See, when, we go to, when I go to God and when I mess up, I always say, God, uh, um, I, I have this tendency of saying, look what I did. I served this person. I, I paid for the guy behind me in Chick-fil-A, and I felt really good about myself. Oh, by the way, I also did this. Um, and it's like a cancel out system, right? Um, but that's not quite how it works. The second misconception is that we are conditioned to believe that um, we're conditioned to believe that we are less than what God says we are. Um, so we, we begin 
this is this was this was my problem. Um, I had two lives growing up, okay, and Peter had this issue too. See, do you, do you guys understand that Peter didn't see himself the way God saw him, right? Because if he did, he never would have ran. And see, I had a really difficult time when I was growing up to see God, see myself the way God saw me. Because um, I, I lived two very pretty different lives as I was growing up. I had a group of my Indian friends, and I had a group of friends I went to high school with. And um, two very different lives, two very different situations. Um, to my Indian friends, I was a definitely a better person than I was to my friends from high school. Because uh, I went to not like the brightest high school, per se. It was, a, it was what they call magnet schools, but it was a lot of like um, underprivileged people. And I remember a lot of my friends, just like me, we would just get in trouble. Um, so growing up for me, like I, I, I was in the church a lot, but I really felt the need. I felt the great desire to, God, like before I drum, I need to like make myself feel better. Or because I, I, I had this sense of I'm not good enough, God. I'm not. And this is a condition that our culture has taught us, that, that honestly like, the devil has given us out of us, is that, that we are not as good as God sees us. He'll look at me night in and say, Bill, you just did this today. Don't you dare try to pray to God. Don't you dare. He'd look at me and say, you definitely sinned yesterday. You had these thoughts. You did these really bad deeds. You hurt these people. Don't you dare think you're good enough to come to me. So my identity started to be less about who Christ was to me and more about my sin. When I'd sit and think about myself, I'd see myself more in my sinfulness, my addictions. I'd see myself more as who I was in my addiction. I'd see myself more as who I was in my shame, in my fall, than who Christ was to me. See, I, I, I was conditioned to believe that I'd never be who God intended for me to be. The third misconception of our generation is this. We have been conditioned that we have nothing that we can offer to God because of our mistakes or our sins. Um, I look, I had a chance to go back home about a week ago. I was spending some time with my parents. I'm, I'm en route to Hawaii in January. I'm moving um, for, a jo- for a job out there, so I needed to go see my parents before I left. Um, so I went to spend some time with my parents, and while I was there, we were just talking and reminiscing and talking about a lot of the friends I grew up with. Um, and where they are today. And I got to see quite a few of them, and, and I saw them, and, I, and it was nostalgia for quite a moment, but after that, it was a slight heartbreak for, for some of them because one of the most common things and common themes I heard from my friends was, Bill, man, like, that church scene is just not for me, man. Like, I, I can't do anything there. Like, like, you know what I do, man. And, and that, if, if I could tell you the number of times I heard that one line from people was, Man, you know, you know, man, I, I can't, there's nothing I can do for the church. Uh, and I remember just, I'm going home on a Thursday night, and it was Halloween that night, actually. I remember like, a bunch of friends, we grabbed dinner, and then I went home that night, and I was, I was pretty just taken back because I thought to myself, I was like, how long did I go living life with the same idea that I had nothing that I could offer the kingdom? Because I was too rotten, I was too bad, I was too... Um, I just couldn't see myself in a light where I was right to serve people. Let me tell you something. Um, Ten years ago, if you told me that I'd be leading worship as like a full-time, if you told a lot of people in my life, like that's not what I saw myself doing. Um, If you told myself I'd pursue music, um, I was the least deserving, I promise. Um, I lived, I had the most secret life of sin. Um, I promise you, I was like, none of my clothes, my parents never knew. I told them years later, like, a week ago, um, about a lot of this stuff, um, just because I thought, just in case they watched this live stream, um, I should probably tell you guys before I tell everyone else, right? So, uh, uh, my mom was like, you drank? What? I'm like, you did what? I'm like, what? Like, where is it coming from? I was like, mom, I had to tell you. I was like, this is years and years later, but I had the need to tell you this, um, because I'm, I, I do want to be transparent with you guys. Um, I just wasn't who I was back then. I wasn't who the church saw me. I wasn't who people saw me. Um, I remember driving here this morning, and I said, how crazy is this? That um, This kid who was so messed up, who hurt a lot of people, who did a lot of things that should have got him in a lot more trouble, is the one you're using to share your gospel this morning. Here's what's crazy. Moses... 
thought he had nothing to offer also. He's like, he's like, I cannot, I can't even talk. I can't, I can't do it. But God commissioned him to free an entire generation of people. Jeremiah, David, Saul, my gosh, Saul. Saul never would have told you he had something to offer for the church. He had more to offer to kill the church than he did to offer the church. Yet God saw him and saw something inside of him. <laughs> and I look into the crowd and I look into the people here and I look at myself in the mirror and I say, how often do I downplay how God sees me? So I wonder what would, Moses, what would have happened if Moses was so stern that he had nothing to offer of people that he said, forget it, God. He walked away. What would have happened? Would the Israelites still be in Egypt? What would it have looked like if he allowed this idea of, I'm, I have nothing to offer a people? One of the greatest misconceptions that ruins our generation is to tell yourself that you can't do anything for the kingdom. See, despite your flaws and your mistakes and your shortcomings, despite the things in your life that look like you don't belong to serve God, and don't give, when I say serve God, I don't mean to be on a stage with lights and play because the truth is this is like the least of what it means to serve God. Because the most of what it means to serve God is when you leave this place. Um, it's how you live and how you love people. Um, see, that, that's a concept that some of us need to grasp, that you're more than what you tell yourself you are. You're more than what people say you are. You're more than what you believe that your mistakes say you are. You're more than what your sin defines you as. Here's two truths, um, and then we're going to close pretty soon. The number one truth um, we read in Galatians, we read in Ephesians, we read it pretty much through all the Pauline epistles, is that we are children of God, okay? Which, and, and, and you're like, what does that mean to me? So my identity is now, is, it's a child of God. So think about this. Um, I'm a child of Cherian and Arul Chaco. It's weird to say my parents' names. Um, Cherian and Arul Chaco, those are my parents, and I'm a child of theirs. And I'm not a child of theirs because I can do good things that, um, make them look good, or I don't because I do enough things to um, say, hey, oh, that's my son. But I'm a child of theirs because I was born to them, right? Like for parents in there, like you don't, you don't pick and choose when your kid's your kid, right? I mean, like I don't have any kids, but I'm just going to go ahead and guess that, right? So you don't, you don't just pick like, okay, well, she's my daughter today, but tomorrow she's not going to be my daughter. Like let, let's just have this, whatever I want to. No, that's not how it is. So when we're called children of God, it literally means we're children of God, right? So when I was a child and when I messed up, my parents didn't throw me out of the house. They corrected me, and they said, but they love me yet the same. Does that make sense? In the same sense, when we're part of the kingdom and we're part of this family, we're going to mess up. We are. We're going to mess up. But that isn't a ticket to say, get the heck out. It's not leave my house. It's not don't come back and serve me. It's, hey, look, you've done wrong. And there is something that you need to understand that what you did wasn't okay. But look, 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 like, you're still my child. Like, I still love you. And that's a concept we need to understand. That we aren't children of God because we can serve him, but we're children of God because he's, because we are his. We're part of his kingdom. It's not a, I bought myself into it, but no, 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 no. It was a, I sent my son to die for you so you can be part of my kingdom, so you can be my child. So this misconception that I'm a child or I'm part of a kingdom depending on what I can do for God is a horrible idea to live by. Because if that's what identifies us, it's I, I'm part of the kingdom when I do good, but when I'm bad, I'm not a Christian. That's a weird way to live life. So be reminded this morning that you're not a child dependent on what you can do. Because I went through life saying that I am a child of God and I am this to God as long as I can do this for God. And here's the second truth. And we're going to talk about this for a few minutes because this is what really means a lot to me. Um, this truth is something that changed who I am. Who we are is never dependent on what we can do for Christ, but rather what he has done for us. Um, that idea revolutionized me. Ephesians 2, 8, verse 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Check this out. 
who we are today is not because of what we do for God. Because truth be told, Christ needs us to do nothing for him. He doesn't. Um, this, this idea of um, I have to do enough good to make myself look good for God, um, it's a poison to our spirit. Because we begin to live life more about what we can do rather than what Christ has already done. See, be reminded of this. See, when, when Jesus came and he died and he suffered, pain was endured to the point of death. And it wasn't so that you guys can come and say that, oh, the cross wasn't quite good enough. Let me do this also. Because that's what it sounds like. When we come and say, um, my salvation or my relationship is dependent on what I can do for you, Christ, right? Whether I'm part of a kingdom is dependent on what I can do for you. It's saying this. It's saying that your cross wasn't quite good enough to forgive me for this sin because it's so bad, so let me help you out there. <laughs> That's absurd. <laughs> That's absurd. Because a Savior and a King chose to come to earth. Um, he chose to die. He chose to give, bleed to the point where water flowed. And for me and you to come to a place where we can say that, man, like, it's really dependent on what I can do for you, God. How many times can I lead worship for you? How many times can I go to a homeless kitchen? How many times can I tell people about Jesus? How many times can I give money away? How many times can I do this? How many times can I do that? Those are all good things, I promise you, all of that. We, we're, we're called to serve. We're called to love. We're taught, like, freely you have received, so freely we must give also. But that is not what allows us to be part of a kingdom. See, don't be misunderstood. Who you are is, was never about what I could do. Who I am was never about my gift or my talent. But who I am was always about my Savior. Who I am was always about Christ who is in me. Who I am was always about the work that he did for me. It was about a year and a half ago. Um, I was probably at where I thought was the best point in my life. Honestly, like, it was like, I, I was on, like, cloud nine, okay? Like, I thought everything was, like, perfect. I thought everything was, like, it, things wouldn't get better than this. Um, I just released my first CD. Um, I, I had already graduated college. Like, I was thinking about moving to, like, L.A. or Nashville and pursuing music full-time. Like, I had all these, like, huge, huge things. Like, like yeah, first CD's out, and we have getting a good response. Like, awesome, this is going to be awesome. Um, I had done my album release in July here, actually. Um, So that was July. Um, Two and a half weeks later, I was in New York. I was doing some recording stuff, and I noticed my voice was just acting so weird. Um, It really, really was. I noticed myself. I was like, man, like, what is happening? Like, like, what is this? So I came back, and some of my close friends, like, you need to get that check, man. Like, you you just need to go. I was like, no, no, no. Um, here's a confession. I hate going to the doctor. Um, it's like one of my, it's like, okay, the dentist is my least favorite, right? But the doctor is definitely close second, honestly, let me just say. Um, so I refuse to ever go to the doctor. Uh, but my friend's like, no, you really, really need to go. So I was like, you know what? All right, fine. So I made an appointment with the ENT. And so I went and I really downplayed. I was like, yeah, I had, it's not bad. It's kind of like a weird scratchy throat thing. And then she was like, Okay, like, tell me more about it. So I told her, she goes, uh, I think we should get this tested. I was like, oh, let, let's do endoscopy. I was like, what's that? She's like, well, we're going to take a, a camera and go through your nose. I was like, what? Wait, what are you talking about? And we're, we're going we're gonna to look at your, your vocal folds, your vocal nodes. I was like, uh, vocal fodule. I was like, uh, okay, sure, why not? I, it was the most strangest feeling ever, if any of you guys ever had it. It was really, really weird. Um, and then you have like a TV screen right here where you can see like your throat inside of it. I was like, that's so weird. Right? And so uh, I remember looking and having this test done and she's like, she walked out of the room, brought someone else in and they both looked at it and they're like, okay. So the other person, and she comes back, she goes, okay, so do you see this thing right here? And I was like, sure. Um, I don't have a frame of reference really for what this is supposed to look like. I was like, yeah, it's that thing right there. She's like, well, that's not supposed to be there. I was like, okay. I was like, what does that mean? She's like, yeah, that shouldn't be there. Like, it shouldn't look like that. And I was like, what? She's like, this is what a normal one looks like, and this is what yours looks like. I was like, oh, my God. 
She's like, yeah. Um, she's like, do you have anyone with you that you want to be here with you? For? I was like, what's happening right now? And she's like, um, you have vocal nodules. And I was like, I was like, yeah. She goes, but this is very bad. Um, it's very severe. It seems like you've had it for quite a while. Um, she's like, there's pretty much a 90% chance that you're never going to sing again. <laughs> and I remember saying, what? I was like, a 90% chance I never would sing again. Um, so here's the thing about when I was 17, I moved out of my house um, to pursue music full time because that's what I felt God called me to do. Um, my parents weren't happy about it. Uh, my parents, I was en route to med school at that time. I had got into a seven year med program. My parents were ecstatic. They're like, yeah, my son's going to do this. And they're like, ah, I want to do music. My parents are like, are you trying to break our hearts or what? Um, but I pursued music anyway. Um, as a kid, I, I left and didn't have the biggest support, and I lived most of my life trying to prove myself to people that this is what God called me to do. I, tried, I had, felt like I had the need to prove my, who I was by getting better as an artist, getting better as a musician, getting better as this. I felt this need to like prove who I was to individuals. Fast forward seven and a half years, seven years. Sitting in a doctor, I studied five and a half years to get a degree in music, um, to do it full time, and I sat in the doctor's office, and she looked at me and said, there's a 90% chance that you'll never sing again. And I was like, I was like, you've, you've got it wrong. I was like, you messed up. I was like, let's do this test one more time. And she goes, she goes, I'm telling you, there's no way to do this wrong. It's a camera in your throat. Like, I didn't do the test wrong. We're looking at it. And I said, I'm like, no, something's off. Like, God, you won't do this to me. I know you won't do this to me, God. I know you won't do this to me, God. And she's like, we need to talk about surgery. I was like, what? I was like, no, 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 no. She's like, you need to come back every four weeks, and we need to check the progress of this. I was like, okay. I remember going to my car, um, and I'm not an emotional person. I'm really, really not. And I don't cry often. I really, really don't. Because, like, I grew up with this, with this like, mentality that guys don't cry, so it's not, you know, it's like, I always have this thing where, like, you don't cry, you're a guy, like, you got to be tough, blah, 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 blah. So I had that mentality growing up. But let me tell you, that day I went to my car, and I wept. I wept so bad because it didn't make sense to me. I sat there in that moment and said, what are you doing? Why did you call me to leave seven years ago to spend all this money on a degree, to study all this hard, for me to now tell people where I just spent thousands of dollars to record an album, I just had the chance to get signed on a label, and now you're telling me I'm never going to sing again. I was angry. I was so, I was furious. I downplayed this to all of my friends. I, I was like, yeah, I have vocal notes, but it's totally cool. Like, yeah, it's whatever. It's like super chill. Like, I just got to be quiet for a little bit. Because how do I tell my closest friends that, how do I tell my band members that I can never sing again? What am I supposed to do? I just asked all of them to quit their jobs so we can travel full time as musicians. So now I'm going to say that I can never sing again? I remember, I remember calling my mom, like, hey, you know, I went to the ENT. I have nodes, but you know what? Don't worry. It's not a big deal. It's nothing big. And every night I'd go home and I'd weep because I was like, God, I have nothing left to who I am. Because everyone knew me as Bill the musician, Bill the worship leader, Bill the songwriter. That's how I knew myself. Over seven years, all I knew myself to be was this artist, was this musician, was this person that, that music was who I was. And now you took it away from me. After you called me to do it, God, what is wrong with you? And I was, I've never been, I've never been one to point fingers at God because it never made sense to me. But this day, I was furious. I was, I was, I was like, I gave everything I had to serve you and you do this to me. And I remember that took me on a spiral of the darkest season of my life. Um, I picked up a really bad hidden drinking habit that no one really knew about. That I would go sit at a bar and I had such a high tolerance for alcohol that it never affected me, but I'd waste money. I sat there, I'd, I'd live my life in this like horrible place where I didn't want to serve, I didn't want to be here, I didn't want to do anything because now I just lost what I thought was all I was. I lost everything. I had the chance to get signed to my dream record label, guys. I had, I had, 
one of the most difficult things is to hear a call from a record label that you had always dreamed and say, God, that's my dream. Them to call you say, hey, you have the chance to come play um, for an artist circle thing. And that's, it's so hard to get that, first of all. And I was like, no way. Like, so here's the date. And I was like, wait, what? Right in the middle of my vocal notes. I couldn't sing. I would sing and I would try to sing and it would be really airy, really weird. Like, what the heck? I had to look at them. I had to call them and be like, hey, I can't make that date, but could we wait? And they're like, sorry, we can't wait. And I was like, what? So there that goes, God. There goes my record dream. There goes my voice. There goes, what do I tell my best friends who are in a band with me? How do I tell them we just spent almost $8,000 on a CD to record, and now we can't do anything with it because your lead singer is no longer able to sing? I just didn't know what to do. Um, a few months went by, and I, it was getting worse and worse. Um, I was further and further because I was like, God, I want less of you because you hurt me a lot, God. And that was my idea, I promise. That was what I thought, genuinely. I was like, God, you're just, you really hurt me. Um, so fast forward a few months. Um, I called one of my closest friends and I said, I need help. So he drove up from Houston and he drove to my apartment at that, literally, it was like 11 o'clock. Left his house, left Houston, drove to me at 3 in the morning, knocked on my door. He embraced me and said, we're going to be okay. I was like, what? He's like, we're going to move forward. And I was like, man, like God doesn't want me. I was like, uh, he, goes, he goes, Bill, do you know what you're saying? I was like, dude, clearly he doesn't want me because he took away the one thing he gave me to serve him. He took it away from me. Like, like obviously he didn't want me anymore. And that was what I genuinely thought. I genuinely thought he was just done with me. I genuinely thought I wasn't quite sure what to tell people or friends of mine because I would no longer be able to say, like, this, like what, what do I do now? What do I become? So I remember in, in a moment, I, he was at my house. He says, well, we need to make, take small steps forward. I was like, okay. He goes, let's cut the alcohol out. I was like, all right, sure. And he goes, let's try to, like, read again the Bible. I was like, um, I was like, all right, fine. So like small steps, but still, I was still angry, still frustrated. And I remember one day, this is, I just remember getting this call and someone said, you need to check this email out that I got. I was like, okay. So they forwarded me an email and I was like, I was like, what is this? And so it was, this, it was this long email, and like I was like, I'm not reading this. And they're like, you have to read this email. You, Billy, you have to read this. I was like, okay. So it was a couple. Um, it was a couple that I had apparently at some point encountered. I, on, true, I don't remember where this happened or what this was. And they had emailed a mutual friend of ours saying, please forward this to Bill. And I was like, what? And this was in the midst of my, uh, like in my hard, the hardest time I've seen in my life. I remember them. And this was the email saying that, um, the re- it read paraphrased like this, Bill, thank you. Um, thank you for being Christ to us when no one else would. And I, I stopped. I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, you saved our marriage. I was like, what? Like, I saved your marriage. Like, what are you talking And I'm like confused. And they're like, and so they expand. They're like, do you remember that night at the restaurant? that you looked at us and you spent two hours just talking to us. We were on the way to sign our divorce papers. But you said a few things to us that night that revolutionized who we understood Christ to be. And I was like, what? I was like, I'm pretty sure I was on the way to the bar after that. I was like, I was like what did I say? What did I do? They're like, but whatever the case is, thank you. Because our love for each other now is greater than it ever was. They're like, we're forever in debt to you. I said, and I was like, I, 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 I was like, what is this stuff saying to me? And my friend's like, dude. And he looked at me, and he goes, you are more than a musician. You are more than music. You are more than an artist. And I remember walking to my van and sitting there and weeping again because for the first time in my life, I understood something. I had messed up at one point where I defined myself by the gift. 
I identified myself by my ability to do something. I identified who I was by what I could do for God. When all along it was this simple, Christ took me on this journey to remind me that it was never about Bindle the musician. It was never about Bindle the artist. It was, never, it was about Bindle the child. Child of God. He's saying you had for God. You had, <laughs> I had gone so far because it had got to my head because when someone asked me what I was or what, who, what I was about, it was about music, not about God. And that's the truth. When someone talked to me, it was about my music. It was about what I could do, my playing. That's what I was about, not about anything else. So what is that story for? It's for this. I spent months and years defining myself by a gift and a talent. I spent another group of years defining myself by a fall and my sins. Most of my life was defined by things that weren't what I was. But finally in the season of life, I understood something. That who I always was and who I will always be is defined by Christ who is in me. The hope of glory. Him and nothing else. If I lose music now, I promise you, I won't go into depression. Because I know who Christ is in me. And I know what he's called me to be. Light in dark places. And music is one thing he's given me now. If I lost another aspect of life, I won't fall apart, I promise. Because you know why? Who I am is Christ who is in me, the hope of glory. That's who I am. That's what defines me. I'm identified by the Christ who is in me and not by anything else the world calls me to be. This morning, as we approach the table, this is my challenge and my plea to you guys. Is that be reminded that it is never about anything else except Christ who is in you, the hope of glory, who's called you to serve in every season of life, who's called you his child, which means that's unconditional. Who has, called, who has said he loves you above everything else. Who says that it is by faith that you've been set free. Not by your works, not by your good deeds, not by your gifts, your talents. Don't ever let your gift take the place of the giver of the gift. Because that's when we have a misunderstanding of what life is about. Don't ever let your sin take the place of the savior of your sin. Because that's when we have a misconception of what life's about. Let's pray. Um, we do communion here slightly different in the sense of when you guys, we're going to pray and then the band will sing, but when you guys feel led, we'll take the elements and we'll sit together and we'll come back and take together. Um, so just as you guys feel led and plead, you guys just, after you pray, you guys, as the band sings, you guys can grab communion. God, we thank you for your love and for your grace. We thank you for calling us and identifying us um, through you and not through anything else. We're not bound to our sin. We're not bound to our titles. We're not bound to our gift, but we are bound to a Savior. Um, who is far greater than anything we can dream of, we can think of, we can believe in. Lord, we're so grateful for your grace and for your love. We're so grateful for your mercy. Um, be our focus, be our center, God. We're so excited for what you're doing, what you're going to do. Be honored, be glorified. In your name we pray, amen.